Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. Pick up. Open that cash register, pal. Now, listen. Go on. But you... I said move. Uh, Everybody stay still or you'll get the same. Uh, you too, lady. So long. Gangbusters has asked the Honorable C. Floyd Eddins, Chief of Police, Birmingham, Alabama, to tell us by proxy of the investigation into this killing. Chief Eddins. Thank you. This killing was not a mystery murder of the story writing type, but it was a mystery and typical of at least 90% of the homicides detectives of American cities are called upon to investigate. For Detective Captain C.L. Pierce, it began late one night in Birmingham, somewhat more than a year ago, when his car responded to a radio call to the West End hamburger shop, where, despite the lateness of the hour, a considerable crowd had been attracted by the presence of three or four police cars and an ambulance. Stick with the car, Mac. Right, Skipper. All right. Police officer. Coming through here. Police officer. Hold on, now, folks. There's nothing for you to see. Oh, hello, Captain. What is it, Patty? The stick-up, sir. One guy shot and killed the owner of the restaurant, a man named Goatley. Who's inside? Jim Norell's in charge. Stand back there. Now, where do you think you are? Okay, uh, McDowell is in the car. Tell him I said to give you a hand with the crowd. Right, Captain. Now, I told you to stand back there. Get out of the way. There's nothing for you to find. And show me just Hello, Jim. You... Uh, come in, Captain. Are you a captain? Is a captain higher than a detective? Now, Sarah. I make a perfectly straightforward statement, Captain, and this detective here won't believe me. Uh, Sarah, yeah. Don't Sarah me. We'll go over it again, Mrs. Trexler, if you'll just have a seat for a minute. Well. Over here, Captain. He's covered up. He's lying right where he fell. You want to see what he looks like? No, not now. Are those people eyewitnesses, Jim? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You got a match? Sure. Oh, will you have a cigarette? No, thanks. Well, what's it look like? The man came in, flashed a gun, announced there was a holdup. Mm-hmm. Apparently, Goatley didn't move quick enough for him. The man fired two shots and ran out. Goatley fell where he's lying. The killer didn't enter the cash register himself. The witnesses said he didn't, and it's all there. Mm-hmm. How many witnesses were there? Uh, that Mr. and Mrs. Trexler, their regular patrons, and that fellow there. Well, let's talk to him first. I'm afraid he's not in a talking condition. What's your name, mister? What's my name got to do with it? All I want is another cup of coffee, black. Service around here is still... Oh, excuse me, Chief. What's your name? My name is Arthur J. Bell. The J, believe it or not, is for January. That's right. I was born... All right. A... You see what occurred here tonight? Well, yes and no. No and yes, that is. You see, all I want is a cup of coffee, black. All right, sit here yes. a minute, mister. Come on, Jim. Where's my coffee? Black. See that he gets home, Jim. Sign Patty. Yeah. Let's talk to the couple. All right, Mrs. Trexler. Now we can talk. It's certainly about time. Sarah. I told you not to Sarah me. Now, Mr. Trexler, how old would you say this man was? Well, I couldn't say exactly, Captain. Somewhere between 25 and 35. Closer to 25. And you said he was 5 foot 8 or 9 inches tall? I did not. I distinctly said he was at least 6 feet. My husband says he was five foot eight or nine. But that's all he was, Sarah. He was six feet if he was an inch. He weighed about 160? Yeah, I couldn't say what he weighed. About 160. Blonde hair? Yes. It's sort of balding, very thin on top. Sarah, it was my impression he had a full head of hair. Where did you get that impression? Well, I saw him. He, he wasn't that far from me. He was balding. I made a distinct point of remembering. But, Sarah, well, now... it's getting kind of late, Mrs. Trexler, and I realize this has been pretty much of a strain on you witnessing a murder. And... I've got stamina, Captain. I may not have much else anymore, but I've got stamina. Yes, well, we certainly appreciate your help. And we'd like to have you down at headquarters in the morning. I'm sure we'll have some suspects for you to look at in the lineup. 
And I'd like to have you go through our file of photographs of known criminals. Oh, any way we can help, any way at all. Uh, thank you. I can have one of my men drive you home. No, no, thanks. We have our car parked across the street. Come on, Sarah. Good night. Good night. See you in the morning. When I say he was balding, why do you contradict me? Sarah, if you had one half, the power of the Well, there go our star witnesses. <laughs> well, at least they agree it was a man. He'll be all right. Can I have those matches again, Jim? Yeah, sure. Here, keep the pack. I got plenty. No, oh, thanks. Uh, Jim, ask the coroner not to start or disturb anything until the laboratory boys get here and have a good look around. And make some pictures. Okay. Hey, where's my coffee? Black. Oh, hasn't Patty seen that lush home yet? The press has got him and Mac in a corner, Captain. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jim, go out and bring those reporters in, will you? I don't know what I can tell them now. At this point, they know as much as we do. That, gangbusters listeners, was a typical beginning to a typical murder investigation. Those were the things Captain Pierce faced. And the prospects weren't much better the next morning when Officer Patty walked into the captain's office. The other witness is here, Captain. All right, Patty. Take him into the lineup room with the Trexlers. Uh, I don't think it'd be such a good idea, Captain. No? No, sir. You better talk with him yourself. He's sitting right outside. All right. Oh, where's Jim Norell? He's up waiting for the laboratory and ballistics reports. He'll be down as soon as he gets them. Okay. Oh, good morning, Mr. Bell. Morning, morning, Chief. Wonderful morning, wonderful. Ooh. See what I mean, Captain? Mr. Bell, you were a witness to a killing last night. Why didn't you do the decent thing and sober up this morning to help us out? Right there, Chief. If I was like this then and I was sober now, how could I remember what happened when I was like this, hmm? How could I, huh? Yeah, uh, I, I, I think it's my patriotic duty to stay drunk. All right, Mr. Bell. You can go home now. We'll call you when we need you. You mean I gotta stay this way until you need me? Oh, fine. Captain. Yeah, come in, Jim. I got the reports. Oh, good. Patty. Yes, sir. See that one of the boys drives Mr. Bell home. Oh, listen, listen, that won't be necessary. I got my own car. I see that one of the boys drives his car home. Come on inside, Jim. Yeah. Listen, I can drive. I've been driving for years. Me. Rough, huh? Yeah, plenty rough. You got a match, Jim? Yeah, sure. Plenty of them. Help yourself to a cigarette. Thanks. Now, what's in the reports? The preliminary ballistics report says the gun used to kill Goatley was a Colt 38 special revolver, apparently. Mm-hmm. What about the lab? They turned up a few odd items sweeping the floor. Nothing of special significance, I don't think. Mm-hmm. Here, I brought them downstairs. A couple of bobby pins. Well, I don't think the killer would be wearing those. A penny? That's not much help. Say, what's this little bolt? I don't know. The technician said they swept it off the floor with the other stuff. What is it, nickel-plated? Yeah, that's what it looks like. Maybe it fell out of some piece of equipment in the lunch stand. It may be. If it... uh, we're all finished with the lineup, Skipper. The Trexlers looked over everybody brought in last night. Nothing, Mac? Nothing. <laughs> Oh, excuse me. Sure. Captain Pierce. Yeah, Patty, Captain. There's a man on the phone here. Says he has some information on the killing. He won't talk to anybody but the boss. All right, put him on. And get busy, Patty. See if you can find out where that call is coming from. Right, sir. Hold on, Captain. Hello? This is Captain Pierce talking. Uh, are you the boss? That's right, of this squad. I want to give myself up. I killed that restaurant man last night. What's your name? Oh, no. Well, how can I tell... You let me do the talking. All right, you do the talking. Now you go to the Woodrow Wilson Park and sit on the first bench facing 21st Street. I'll meet you there in a half an hour and give myself up. Goodbye. Hello? Hello? Oh, well, boys, maybe the case is washed up. Yeah? That man says he's the killer. Wants to give himself up. I have to meet him in half an hour. Oh, you never know, Skipper. Sometimes the top ones do somersaults on you. Yeah, Max, sometimes. Jim, let me have those matches again, will you? Yeah, sure. Catch. Well, gangbusters listeners, that's how things go in a murder investigation. But events took a stranger turn when Captain Pierce met the man who confessed he was the killer. And once again, we hear from tonight's narrator, Chief of Police, C. Floyd Eddins of Birmingham, Alabama. Well, as I was telling you, at the appointed time, Captain Pierce seated himself on the proper bench in Woodrow Wilson Park in the heart of downtown Birmingham. Other detectives were at strategic points along Park Avenue and on 20th Street, where they could watch the whole affair and move in quickly if necessary. 
The captain sat on the bench alone for some minutes before a carelessly dressed man approached him. Uh, excuse me. Yeah? You mind if I sit down? Well, uh... If, uh, if you're that captain, I'm the man you're waiting for. Oh. All right, sit down. Thank you. I want to give myself up. I don't know how I could have done it. I come from such a fine old family. What's your name? My name is William Seldom. I, I, I couldn't sleep last night. My, my, my conscience kept gnawing at me. It, it, it was a compulsion, see? A compulsion. I felt I had to kill him. That, that poor innocent soul in a pool of blood. Oh, I, I must be punished. What did you do with the knife? What knife? The knife you stabbed him with. Oh, oh that... I threw it in the sewer. You remember how many times you stabbed him? You stabbed him? Oh, uh, again and again and again. Uh, I don't know. And you should remember. Say, who are you waving to? Oh, just some friends of mine. Uh, I, I stabbed him again and again and again. And I was covered with blood. Is everything okay, Cam? Yeah, fine. Gentlemen, this is Mr. Seldom. Uh, how do you do? How do Mac. Mr. Seldom says he committed a murder. Suppose you take him to jail. You mean to that nice jail, Skipper, the uh, white one? Uh-huh. Mm. I know where you're sending me. You're not sending me to jail. You're sending me to the psychiatric ward. Uh, come on, Mr. Seldom. But, but I've been to the psychiatric ward before. Yes, I know. Well, Captain? Well, yourself. Come on, let's get back to the office and work on this thing the hard way. I got a hunch about that gun. Uh, uh, Jim. Sure, I've got a match. Uh, thanks. I don't know how it'll work out, but... But we can try it anyway. Come on. Of course, the police are always interested in help from citizens. But sorting the useful from the well-intentioned but irrelevant and crackpot often takes hundreds of man-hours of investigation. Not more than half an hour later, Captain Pierce was back at his desk reconstructing the crime with the help of one of the two halfway reliable witnesses, Mr. Alfred Trexler. Present also were Detective Jim Norrell and G.S. Patty, but not the contradicting Mrs. Sarah Trexler. The proprietor didn't move fast enough to suit him. Now, to the best of your recollection, Mr. Trexler, that's when he fired the shot. Well, yes, Captain, to the best of my recollection, but last night Sarah said that he fired the shot uh, Mr. After... Trexler... Your wife is upstairs looking over photographs in the rogues' gallery. When she gets finished, we'll get her conception of what happened. Right now, we want yours. Yes, sir. Jim, may we see your gun, please? Sure, Captain. Hold it up so Mr. Trexler can see it. That's it. Now, Mr. Trexler, was the gun the bandit had anything like that gun? No, no, nothing like it. The bandit had a revolver. That gun is an automatic, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Uh, yes. All right, Jim. Harry? Yes, sir. Let's see your gun. Sure thing, Captain. Well, Mr. Trexler? Now, that's a revolver, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it, it's not like the revolver the bandit had. All right, Patty. That gun is a Smith & Wesson, Mr. Trexler. Now, I've got another gun in my desk drawer, another make of revolver. Is this anything like the gun the bandit had? <laughs> it's the gun. It's the very gun he used to kill him. How do you know it's the very gun? It, it just occurred to me now. That little silver screw was in the side. I just remembered I couldn't keep my eyes off it. The little silver screw. That's my gun, Mr. Trexler. My personal gun. But, but... <laughs> I know. The bandit had an identical gun. A Colt 38 Special. We found that little bolt on the floor of the restaurant. We didn't know where it came from. Now we know, don't we? Yes, I suppose we do. Yes, I found the one place on a Colt 38 that the little boat fit. Right forward of the trigger guard. It must have come loose and jumped out when the killer fired at Mr. Goatley. That's wonderful, Captain. Well, not so wonderful, Mr. Trexler. And when you get right down to it, all we've got is a little nickel-plated boat. Yes, gangbusters listeners, that's all Captain Pierce had. A little nickel-plated boat. And in a criminal investigation, you go to work with what you've got. So begins the checking and the rechecking. Same questions asked over and over again to hundreds of people. Holders of gun permits, pawn shops, sporting goods stores, the inches of worn shoe leather. This is the unseen part of a murder investigation. The routine, the drudgery, and the honest-to-goodness toil. But sometimes it pays off. 
Captain Pierce. Hello, Skipper McDowell. Yes, Mac. I don't know, Skipper, but maybe I got something. What? Well, I made a call out in Inslee on a guy who holds a gun permit. Yeah? Well, he's not home. He's at work. But I got to talk to his wife about the gun. She couldn't find it any place in the house, but she told me there was a bolt missing, and her husband replaced it with a nickel plate bolt he had around. Mac, what's the name of the man? Well, his name is Andrew Jennings. He works as a puddler at Southern Steel. He's working right now on the 8th to 4th shift. Okay. Bring the woman in here. In the meantime, we'll take a run out to the mill and talk to the husband. They got him waiting in the foreman's office, Captain, right here. Oh, good, Jim. Are you Andrew Jennings? Yeah, I'm Jennings. We're police officers. Police? Well, what's the trouble? Uh, my wife. Something's happened to my wife. No, nothing has happened to your wife. We want to talk to you. To me? You hold a permit for a 38 caliber Colt special revolver? And... Yeah, I hold a permit. I, I needed the gun. We had prowlers in the neighborhood last summer. Where's the gun now? Well, I sold it. I sold it to a fellow last week. What's the trouble? What's the fellow's name? Pilly. Steve Pilly. Hey, Steve didn't get into a jam with it, did he? Where does Steve live? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I just happened to meet him in a cafe. What cafe? In Johnny's, out in Ansley, near where I live. Where does he work? Oh, I don't know. I don't know him that well. What's the trouble? Has he gotten in a jam with it? Oh, we don't know for sure. But we think that was the gun that was used to kill that restaurant man. Oh, no. Steve wouldn't do a thing like that. The gun might have, and Steve might have been holding it. Incidentally, where were you Monday night? Me? Uh, look, I, I was at home, asleep. You can ask my wife. We will. There's one more thing I want to know, Jennings. Hey, yeah, sure, anything. When did you last fire that gun? Well, a couple of months ago, I guess. Uh, I took it out to my brother's place. He's got a place near Bessemer. We're doing a little target practice. What were you shooting at? Oh, nothing. Just tin cans and stuff. We laid them against the shed and they're shooting at them. Did any of the slugs hit the shed? Oh, yeah, I guess so. Lots of them, I guess. All right, come on, Jennings. Let's take a ride out to your brother's place. I'd like to dig one of those slugs out of the shed. Yeah, but I'm working. It's all right. I'll fix that. Oh, okay. Say, I couldn't have one of them cigarettes, too, could I? I could use one. Yeah, sure. Here you are. Uh, much obliged. Match, Captain? Yeah, naturally. Thanks, Jim. Thanks. Don't mention it. Uh, Jim, get started on tracing the Steve Pilly. Jennings and I will have a run out to his brother's place and take a look around. Okay, Captain. I'll try to have him in tow by the time you get back. Well, gangbusters listeners, there's a problem for you. Given just a name, find the person from among 400,000. The files of the Bureau of Identification were checked. No luck. The city directory, no Steve Pilly. The telephone company, the electric light company, the general post office, the auto registration and driver's license bureaus, no Steve Pilly. And they were still looking late in the afternoon when Captain Pierce returned to the office with the erstwhile owner of a gun, steel worker Andrew Jennings. All right, have a seat there, Jennings. Hey, Captain, I ought to get home. My wife's got dinner. Your wife knows you'll be late, Jennings. Hello, Captain. And Jim? She does? She was here almost all afternoon. Oh. oh. Uh, look, Captain, uh, you... Sit down there, Jennings. But I went all the way up to my brother's with you. I lose a day's pay. Now, what else do you want? The slugs we got are now being compared with the ones we took out of the murdered man. If they match up, that means your gun did the killing. And in that case, we'll have a lot more talking to do. Oh. Oh, I see. Oh, good. Now, sit down. Captain. Yes, let's go inside, Jim. We haven't been able to find a trace of any Steve Pilly yet. No? I'm beginning to have a faint suspicion there is no such party. Well, why should Jennings say there is? For the best reason. Well, he was at home. His wife said he was. Wives aren't always the most reliable thing in the world. I think we ought to give the Trexlers a look at him. Maybe we'll get a make. Yeah, sure, Jim. Why not? I'll call and get him down here right away. If I'll get it. Captain Pierce. Uh, Patty, Captain. Yes, what do you got, Patty? There is a Steve Pilly. Oh? Where'd you get the line? Unemployment compensation office. A man named Steve Pilly, address given as 8722 Second Avenue, a rooming house there. He got his final unemployment compensation check a week ago Thursday. And he had just time enough to run out of money. Well, they tell me, yeah, he's been in and out of this office every other month for the last year. Never held a job longer than that. Mm-hmm. Okay, Patty. Bring everything you can on him and get in here. You bet, Captain. What's up? There is a Steve Pilly. Oh? Mm -hmm. Skipper. Yes, Mac. The slugs you brought in come out of the murder gun. Uh-huh. Didn't need to take more than one look. Well, we're getting close, I guess. Yeah, awful close. I got one, Captain. Oh, thanks, Jim. As soon as Patty gets back here, I want to stake out at 8722 2nd Avenue. There's a boy who lives there I'd like to talk to. 
Four o'clock in the morning is probably the most satisfactory time of day to make an arrest. The subject in question is generally at home, and usually too sleepy to get himself hurt or to hurt any police officers. So at four o'clock the next morning, two city cars pulled up in front of the rooming house at 8722 2nd Avenue. They were greeted by a figure who stepped out of a nearby shadowy doorway. This is Patty, Skipper. Yeah, okay. We're all set here, Captain. Who's around in back? Thatcher and Moore from the district. Okay. Max, come on. Thank you. I'm with you. I got it all fixed with the landlady. Front door is open. We can just walk right in. Hi, Captain. Okay, Jim. Let's go. Sure, I'm running away. Mac, plant yourself across the street and watch the windows. Right, Skipper. You park yourself on the front stairs, Patty. Right here. Okay, Captain. Take it easy. Front door's open. Walk on in. Yeah. Second floor front, Jim. My new car was delivered today. Oh, that's so? Yeah. Did you get a four-door? No, a club coupe. That's as big as I need. Mm -hmm. well, congratulations. Thanks. Okay. Try the door. Easy. It's not locked. Okay. Open it all the way. Oh, he's got it on the chair. Well, lay on it. Come on, together. Hit it. Yeah. Uh, again. Yeah. Come on, again. Oh, there he is. Police officers, Tilly. Get away from that window. Oh, no, no, no. Come on, downstairs, fast. Go on. What a dope. All right, I got it. Yes, Skipper. How is he? Dead? No, Captain, the guy was lucky. He fell through that awning on the way down. I think he's going to come out of it. Hey, here's the gun, Skipper. I don't want to jump. Go call an ambulance, Mac. Sure, Jim, right away. Oh, he's a nice-looking boy, Captain. Well, what's that supposed to get him? Cigarette, Penny? Yeah, Jim. Much obliged. Captain? Uh, no, uh, no thanks, Jim. I've been smoking too much lately. Got to cut down. Well, gangbusters listeners, that was the end of this murder investigation. And not long afterwards, the killer, Steve Pilly, was executed in Alabama's electric chair. Well, thank you, Chief of Police C. Floyd Eddins of Birmingham, Alabama, for this telling insight into police work. And gangbusters, congratulations to all the Birmingham officers who participated in the investigation leading to the solution of this brutal crime. Tonight's case was dramatized by Stanley Niss and directed by George Zachary with Les Damon and Art Carney in leading roles. Roger Foster speaking.